Welcome to today's edition of The World Today on the Art of Gift Giving in International Diplomacy. Our discussion today will focus on the behind the scenes work that goes into hosting and being hosted by foreign dignitaries and the special role that the exchange of gift plays in global affairs and diplomacy. National level gift exchange needs to be thoughtful, meaningful, culturally appropriate, and send the right message to advance strategic goals. To help us understand the depth and strategy behind the most effective diplomatic gift exchange, I am delighted to welcome Ambassador Capricia P. Marshall, President of Global Engagement Strategies and a visiting fellow at Perry World House. Ambassador Marshall is the author of Protocol, The Power of Diplomacy and How to Make It Work for You, Go Out and Buy It. She is currently ambassador in residence at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. Um, she served as White House Social Secretary in the Clinton administration from 1997 until 2001, and the United States Chief of Protocol in the Obama administration from 2009 until 2013. Capricia, welcome to the stage to begin our discussion with some opening remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for those for that introduction. LaShawn, uh, it is a pleasure to be back on Penn's campus, although I think probably just a little bit too many times my son, who is a graduating senior, just chagrin, he was in Mask and Wake, my husband and I came back, he was in Discord, his acapella concert, my husband and I came back, his girlfriend uh, had a wonderful play, Natalie, and we came back and uh, we're thrilled to be coming back for five full days for his graduation very, very soon in May. So we love coming to the campus. We love visiting Penn. So I was absolutely thrilled when Perry Worldhouse invited me to come for a visit. Three wonderful days to this extraordinary facility. You are so incredibly lucky. This is just really wonderful. And, you know, Richard Perry, was a visionist. I mean, he just really, he knew what he wanted to create and in collaboration brilliantly with the University of Pennsylvania, they created all of this. And inside of this wonderful facility are just the most amazing people who work here. Um, I have to give a, a little nod to Michael, who is literally departing at this moment and making his way to Washington, DC, where we will host him. His, his brilliance in, in convening the most extraordinary uh, individuals certainly uh, will be missed here, but you know what Perry World House loses, our country gains. So best of luck, Michael. But you know that your shoes will be filled um, with the talent, brilliance, and humor of the fabulous LaShawn. So I'm very lucky to be, and hopefully will continue to be working with her in uh, the months and maybe even years to come. Uh, and she has a wonderful group of individuals here that she um, she has surrounding her. They're just all truly terrific. I have to give a special shout out though to Tom Shattuck, um, who created my schedule, made sure I stayed on schedule and was really diplomatic and gracious when I was late, which was often to keep me moving along. So thank you, Tom. Most people have no idea what protocol is or what the chief of protocol does. Um, if you are one of those individuals, you are in fine company with the president of the United States. Now, it, I, the president, my president, President Obama, the president that I worked for, I had really no idea what my job was until I showed him. And once I showed him, he, I want to say, embraced me that he was just like, okay, where is Capricia? I need my one, two, three to make sure I'm not messing up. Um, so, you know, protocol can be confusing. Let me give you a little bit of history. Who were the first chiefs of protocol? The ancestors to modern day protocol officers were Greek heralds who were sent to other cities and states to set before the journey of their leaders. And they were guaranteed safe passage because there was presumed protection by the gods. I never had any protection by any gods when I was performing my summits and putting together uh, bilaterals. I could have used a bit of that protection. 
protocol really began to take shape at the Vienna Convention in 1815. The Vienna Regulation creates created rules governing the engagements of international diplomatic encounters, specifically precedence order, who comes first, second, and third in our diplomatic meetings, hence avoiding possible and literally bloodshed. With the establishment of more diplomatic rules and order and logistics, the position of chief of protocol evolved. In the United States, the first chief of protocol was appointed in 1928. That was James Clement Dunn. And it, but it was not until 1976 to, was there a woman who was appointed to the position of chief of protocol. And that was Shirley Temple Black. Yes, that Shirley Temple the little blonde. Um, I was the eighth woman appointed to the position and currently the current chief of protocol. And after me, there were men that were appointed to the position protocol. So what is protocol? Protocol is the bridge between the US government and our foreign visitors when they come to our country and then when the president travels abroad. In protocol, we create the literal framework within which diplomacy take place, those difficult discussions that the president will engage with within his, with his counterparts. Often I am asked, does protocol matter? Does, does where someone sits and who enters the door first? Does all that really matter? And in my head, I am hearing, are you kidding me? Yes, it matters. It all really matters. You know, in protocol, we set the tone for a visit. And depending upon the framework that we create, we have the capacity to set many different tones from, it's good to see you again, my friend, or, oh, it's nice to meet you, new leader, to, let's get down to business. This is going to be a tough discussion. And if we let the chips fall where they may, we would be creating so many opportunities for so many inevitable slights. Your global guest may think you deliberately created a mishap and now is distrustful of the relationship. You also missed creating a critical connection with that team that is sitting across the bilateral table from you. And most importantly, you squandered the chance to pivot the power of the interaction in your leader's favor. Protocol instead creates an environment that is welcoming and assuring. And when utilized well as a tool in diplomacy, it can offer your leader an advantage in any negotiation. For instance, I specifically chose a room for President Obama's first meeting with Vladimir Putin as president that was elegant, but was small in size and had a lower ceiling height. We didn't have a lot of options, but this room that I chose really was going to fit the bill. Why did I choose that? Well, President Obama had quite a few issues on his plate that he needed to discuss with President Putin, including Syria. The hope of the US delegation was that we were gonna draw him in closer to our line of thinking. So by bringing him closer to President Obama, literally physically closer to him, he was forced into having uh, uh, discussions on some of these hardcore issues. And a lower ceiling height tends to make people a bit more decisive. You've seen President Putin recently at these very large tables, long tables, where he is seated on one side and his counterparts, the people he's having a discussion with, are at the far other end, creating enormous space between him and the others. That's not due to COVID. It is very deliberate. He is creating an uncertain space in the relationship and certainly uncertainty when it comes to the outcomes. This is an example of soft power. Joseph Nye coined the phrase, uh, and he did so uh, stating that soft power was a way in which we drew people into our way of thinking, as opposed to hard power like we are witnessing today in Ukraine and Russia with economic sanctions and war. Gift giving is a very potent, very powerful soft power tool when executed with intention. 
a proper gift has the potential to transmit so much in a single object. And when the gift exchange goes right, which frankly under me, it usually did, um, it was brilliant diplomacy. And when it did not, the result was usually splattered across the front pages of the paper, diverting attention away from those critical discussions and meetings. One of the best examples that I can ha that I have of the effectiveness of um, of gift giving as a soft power tool was at the uh, 2011 visit that President Obama had with uh, in the UK at the invitation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I literally thought I'd gone to the peaks of protocol. I was so thrilled about this visit. Um, and so once it was announced, we, the protocol team, went about trying to find the absolute right gift for several reasons. First, we of course wanted to emphasize the importance of this very special relationship between the US and the UK. But additionally, <laughs> regrettably, we also needed to slightly erase the memory of the first gift exchange in 2009, when I was not yet chief of protocol, between the president and her majesty. At that gift, she was given an iPod. And it was loaded with, I guess, some of her favorite songs. Now, the gift was nice enough, but because it was a US model, she couldn't quite use it in the UK. So that was number one. But most importantly, you know, it was too familiar for a working visit uh, for this first official visit between these two leaders. So <laughs> in 2011, we were prepared for the UK press corps. Uh, they were on high alert to see what would those Americans bring Her Majesty? <laughs> Sorry about the accent. <laughs> well, I just wanna say we crushed it. Knowing Her Majesty's affection for her father, King George VI, we created an album of memorabilia from his visit to the US in 1939. It was the first time a ruling British monarch ever visited the United States. We also gave Her Majesty a Tiffany brooch selected personally by Mrs. Obama that she wore the following evening at a dinner hosted by the President and Mrs. Obama, and also at an official state visit of President Trump and Mrs. Trump. Hmm. Interesting choice. Let me give you the setting here. When Her Majesty and the President emerged from this luncheon, this wonderful luncheon at the state visit, and approached our gift table, she was scooting the President along. Come along, Mr. President, come along. And she's looking at her watch and watching the time. Come along, and she's making her way. She's just so swishy adorable. And she began to page through this beautiful portfolio that we had created. She just glowed. And she looked up at the president. And I want to say she had a little tear in her eye. And I had a little tear in my eye. But she just was so happy. And the president was beaming down at her, at her happiness. And it just was one of those magical gift giving moments. And I'm like, yes, we got it. This is cool. This is just going so super well. And then she made her way over to the next gift. Now we knew that Prince Philip um, had an affection for racing carriage ponies. And so we created Fell's Bits and Shanks for his carriage ponies. Uh, an artisan actually created, artisans from Ohio and Colorado uh, created them for us. And so she said, oh, Philip, look what they got your ponies. And so he made his way on over him. And you know, now I say, bless his soul. And he lifted up the bits and shanks and his hood and his kind of grimacing and was like, mm, these will break my pony's jaws. And she looks at him and she's just like, oh, and the president's like, ooh. And I'm like, no, it was so good for one fleeting moment. And so she's like, nonsense. Majesty saves the day. She calls over this really tall man who's like the, the head of the horses or something. And he walks over and lifts him up and he says, oh, no, your majesty, this is fine workmanship. And she's like, hmm. She looks at Philip with that, you know, that look that says, I, I told you so. And then she says, oh, now who is this gift for? And it was our final gift on the gift giving table. And it was for Prince Charles and Lady Camilla. 
and we had learned that, you know, he, of course, is an environmentalist. And we created a box out of a tree that had fallen, a magnolia tree that had fallen on the south grounds. And in it, we had filled it with saplings from the White House, Mount Vernon, and Monticello. And a bit of White House honey. The Obamas had beehives on the south grounds. Well, oh. Prince Charles was just overwhelmed. He was so grateful. Thank you so very much for this lovely gift. And oh, by the way, I also have uh, honeybees. I'll have to give you some of my honey. And Prince Philip, not to be outdone, comes over and he's just like, oh, well, I have some honey as well. Let me share that honey. I mean, you know. And so we had a little bit of a honey off that was going on. Uh, and then they finally escorted me back to the U.S. delegation hold room where I received a call from uh, Team Protocol. And they informed me, they said, oh, Grisha, on the television, the UK anchors are saying, the Americans get it right. Her majesty very pleased with gifts. And that was the exclamation point that we were all waiting for. That showcased the power, the soft power of gift giving. And so I'd love to discuss further with all of you all of the other tools I used in soft power when it comes to gift giving and uh, some of the do's and don'ts. So I look forward to having this conversation now with LaShawn. Thank you so much. Well, I don't have to turn on the mic, right? So it's on. Can you hear me, everyone in the audience? Um, we've had a little bit of AV problems. I'm gonna try my best today not to have the sound bouncing everywhere. So that's a hard act to follow. And if you learn nothing more in the 15 or 20 minutes that you've been here, um, part of the takeaway message for me is that um, there's an extraordinary amount of work that goes into gift giving and protocol. Um, if you've ever gone to a dinner party or given someone the wrong gift, you absolutely know how poorly the whole thing can land. But based on what you've just said, it's also clear that you, your, you and your staff do deep research to figure out the appropriate level of gift. And without commenting on the iPod mm -hmm. incident, um, I actually wanted to start with kind of something kind of funny, which is who tells the president no? So in your mind, and particularly mm -hmm. since you weren't responsible for that, how would you have avoided giving Her Majesty a US iPod? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the position of chief of protocol you should become accustomed to saying no quite often. I mean, it's sort of our job. I mean, I used to stand up on my tippy toes in front of the president right before he was about to go out on stage for any type of diplomatic engagement and say, sir, 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 wait, 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 wait. Uh, I said, let me give you my one, two, threes. You can't see this. Don't touch them. Do this. And you know, he's, he, okay, Kapusha, okay. And became very accustomed to it. So I was grateful that he gave me that opportunity and that he listened to me because he knew that I had his best interest and our country's best interest, you know, really uh, front of mind in all of these engagements. So in that instance, first of all, I would have never suggested it because I would have done my research. You were better and, than that. Yes. Yeah. And as you say, LaShawn, I mean, we did go through a great deal of research. Uh, we looked up information about the leader. I would drill our U.S. Embassy abroad about any information that they had also asking the ambassador located in Washington, D.C., anything and everything that they know about him, about the leader. I mean, we just continually collected as much information as we possibly could. And, um, and then we would come up with a memo that we presented to the president with three options. Of course, the first option was always my favorite and the one I hoped he chose. And if he would skip down to two or three, I said, do you really want to do that one? Because I really think that maybe number one is the one that you want to choose. Ultimately, it is his choice. So um, if you did choose two or three, then, you know, we sort of went along with that. But I would have, first of all, never suggested it. And if he had come to me with the idea, I would have explained to him, this is why you don't want to do this. So, and I'm interested in this kind of approach of using um, gift giving as soft power. And, you know, you've explained the definition and you all are PIN community members. And so, you know, the definition of soft power, but I'm wondering, how did it benefit uh, the visit to England the second time? So given all of the uh, parts for one's horse or pony, given the honey uh, competition, how did it actually affect negotiate well, discussions and um, 
the U.S.'s time in England. Well, it, it, the the effectiveness isn't um, immediately um, uh, tangible. You you watch as a relationship grows. You're trying to create those connections in protocol. That was our ideal was that we created this framework for diplomacy and we're going to use these various tools and the, the sum of all of those interactions will hopefully lead to an outcome that the EU has, has, um, is trying to achieve in its foreign policy goals. Uh, and in this instance, it was really conveying that we are, our nations are close, we are friendly, we are, we are arm in arm with one another. In addition to the gift that we gave to Her Majesty, you know, we also had the engagement with Prime Minister Cameron. And um, they were, <laughs> we had learned that uh, they were borrowing a, a barbecue from a friend because someone locally, uh, because they didn't have one of their own. An and actual grill? An actual grill. Okay. Because they were having a an event, the two leaders were having an event that they um, uh, were hosting veterans, US veterans and UK veterans at, and they were serving them. And it was really wonderful, a lovely, wonderful event. So we found an American grill maker. We created the grill bit by bit out of Chicago. And on it, we put, we emblazoned what we call friendship flags, the flags of the United States and the UK there. I mean, they were really touched by that. They, they, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, you, you learned something about us. We don't have a grill. We need a grill here at 10 Downing. And you gave us a wonderful reminder that every time we use this, we will think of this time in this relationship. Um, another kind of, and we will move to questions from both the audience, um, here at Perry World House and the audience online in a couple of minutes. But another issue that you mentioned was kind of the evolution of the position in terms of there being more female chiefs of protocol. And I have a question about that, but before I get to that question, I want you to talk a little bit about the evolution of the position itself. So it strikes me that the chief of protocol in 1977 might have had a slightly different ambit or a different understanding of the position versus a chief of protocol today, that the standards have changed, the expectations have changed, the depth of research, I mean, it's infinite research that can be done on the internet. So in your mind, what have been some of the most important changes over the decades? Well, I would agree with you. Yes, it absolutely has evolved, but there are traditions with this posting that are very firmly planted and intentionally. Because in protocol, what we are trying to do is set expectations. We want those who come to our country to know exactly what we have planned for them. Um, and same, likewise, when we go to a, a country abroad, um, for instance, the position of honor is always on the right. And I actually hosted a Global Chiefs of Protocol conference. And there were two countries that kept insisting that it was on the left. And all of us were like, I mean, this was a hundred chiefs of protocol <laughs> against two. And we're like, no, 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 it's on the right. And you better make sure that your leader knows that this is on the right. And it really does make a difference when they stand, when they're visiting and they're standing there, they know that they're in this position of honor. They know where to go to. It's second nature to them. Um, they won't become confused in the moment. And that's really important. So we do hold firmly to many of these traditions throughout many, many, many years. We pass them down. LaShawn had been asking me, how do you know this? And I'm like, you literally pass it down. You pass down so much of this information from administration to administration, chief to chief. I, we just had a convening with the new chief and giving him some insights into the job. But you know, as technology, as LaShawn notes, uh, has, has evolved, um, you know, we're evolving with that. Uh, Zoom protocol is now uh, a new <laughs> protocol that we need to adhere to. And I've- Please I've tell us what it. that is, because I don't know well, that we've I've been it. witnessing it go, abysmally wrong, like horrifically wrong. Like first, test your tech, make sure the technology is working. How many times have we seen people go, and we've said, unmute, unmute, or they just aren't hooked up to their sound. And so uh, someone's saying something very, very important you wanna make sure. Now that is about technology, and, and but it's really important when it comes to those moments of where you're trying to make some sort of connection through um, a, a new mode of communication. 
uh, so I'm I'm actually setting about to work with someone on writing a a whole new addendum to my book on on these the, the new protocols for this new these new technologies. Um, you know, and and as you note, um, there are a few more women in the position as chief of protocol. How's, How's that changed things? Many? What has it meant? Well, practice? what's really fascinating is, frankly, the reason why there are so few women is that most male, which are frankly almost all leaders in the world, uh, decide that they want to select male chiefs of protocol. Because I was attached to President Obama's side 24 7 when we traveled the moment we got onto air force one to the moment we returned back to the united states you're at every engagement every meeting every every second of that international time required some type of protocol interaction and i was just quite lucky that he chose me a woman to serve in that post and um I, I, I also share with LaShawn that I have this wonderful photograph that I cherish of um, <laughs> myself at a G20 summit with many of my counterparts, many of my male counterparts, and I'm wearing the only pump and the rest are these male loafers. It's like in this just sea of shoes. Uh, it's just one of my favorites. It's so emblematic of that there's was just one woman uh, chief out of all of the G20 countries. Um, and so, you know, we, we work hard. Actually, there was an instance, and I won't mention the country, but where we were, it was another global summit, and the chiefs were meeting, and one of my friends came up to me and said, are you planning on going to um, the cocktail that this chief of this country was hosting? And I said, no, I, oh my gosh. And, you know, I miss emails all the time. I'm like, oh no, I missed something. Oh gosh, what time is it? Where is it? And he told me. So I'm like, okay, great. I'll see you there. So I went and I sat down and, and it was at a round table, which was sort of interesting because I thought it was more of a social engagement, but no, he had notes and he had an agenda and it was seated. And so I sat down at one of the chairs and he entered the room and he looked at me. And it was one of those looks of, that said, what are you doing here? And again, I was the only woman sitting at the table. And I was just like, is there something wrong? I was thinking, <laughs> you know, do I have something on me? And he's like, you know, you don't need to come to this, Ambassador Marshall. We're all fine here. I was just like, oh, but everybody else is here. And, and then I thought, well, maybe it's a United States thing. And then I realized, no, it was a woman thing. And that he just... Did he came from a culture and from a country that didn't quite value women in those positions. And so I was being made to be uncomfortable. I said, no, you know what? I'm good. I'm going to stay. He said, you know, we all might have something to discuss. I'm sure I have a lot to say. So I think I'll stay. And there was nothing he could really do except for blatantly. And it would be so against protocol to ask me to leave. It would be just, I mean, it was already really rude not to have invited me, but it would have been horrifically rude to have excluded me. So it was one of those examples. Um, so I'm going to move to audience questions at Perry Roll House in one minute. I will ask one more question, and then I have questions on my iPad, which I sometimes neglect to ask, um, And but I'm going to turn to you first after I ask this question. So that story reminds me of something, which is how difficult it can be for women to negotiate and occupy spaces of power. And it is, a, it is a position and a space of power. Um, and how you as the chief of protocol helped negotiate customary practices mm -hmm. that would have been hard to countenance being from the United States. So that is a kind of critically important role of your office. Oh, And anything you can share without naming specific countries. Oh, no. I mean, it, 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 most importantly, I think as a woman, and this, this applies to across the board, is step into that position of power, you know, take the middle seat, demand to give the opening keynote remarks, make sure that they know that you're the head of the delegation. You know, in some countries, even when, you know, uh, the, the, a woman is heading our delegation, they will put her third or fourth in a line. And you're like, no, she's the head of the delegation. And you would hope that also your delegation is saying, no, that she's the, 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 the top person here and, and making sure that they're more prominent, but take that, you know, don't, to sit in the back bench, sit at the table. Um, there's quite a bit that we can do to really reinforce that. But we should also 
be sensitive. I mean, there is a balancing act where we need to be culturally sensitive to the requests of other countries. For instance, if they ask to cover the head for a variety of different reasons, usually for religious reasons, then yes, we should adhere to that. It is their country, it's their culture, and it just shows great respect that you should have for that. You know, it's not, and in my office, I was always aware of what protocol officers were wearing. You know, I, I just did not like arm. This was this was Capricia Marshall, but I was a lot more conservative. I did not like arm showing, and I did not like toes showing. So I like closed toe shoes, and I like to have a cover. and And all the women in our office would carry a shawl. And it wasn't because we were bearing our bodies. It was just again showing some respect when we were in someone else's country. Um, I'm going to give the audience here an opportunity to start moving toward the mic. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask one question from my handy iPad or I will delay that. And if you could just make sure you speak clearly in the mic so that the people online can hear you. Yes. And if you wouldn't mind telling us your pen affiliation, if you're a student and if you're comfortable doing that. Absolutely. Yes. My name is Chelsea. I'm a master public health student um, and I'm on a global health track. So I'm fascinated by everything that you've shared. Um, I have two questions. I'll boil it down to those two. My first is, I'm very curious about your professional and personal experiences and kind of the journey that brought you to this position. I'd never heard of the chief of protocol before, but I'm glad that I'm learning about it today. Um, and in my personal experience, thinking about global health, I'm curious what your advice would be in terms of how to boil some of this, your experiences, boiling that down to maybe um, individual interactions, individual gift giving in intercultural spaces. Oh. Thank Two you. great questions. Thank you. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on, as my son could say. Um, <laughs> yes, he knows well about my background. Uh, but I would say that I, I'm first generation American. I come from a, um, my mother was from Mexico, and my father from Croatia. And I grew up in my maternal grandmother's home, which was like the United Nations, frankly. I mean, we had so many different people in that house at all times that spoke different languages. We served so many different types of food and celebrated so many different cultures. Um, it just became really a part of my core. And um, so after graduating from uh, university uh, with a, an international relations uh, major, I was seeking out opportunities of where I could you know, just find it. And I too, at that time, did not know about the Jiva protocol at all. I went out into, onto a campaign and um, on that uh, campaign, I, uh, for this unknown governor from Arkansas, uh, I met his brilliant wife who became my mentor. And so one of the things I would strongly suggest is, is for those who are still in university is finding a great mentor. And she was extraordinary for me and still is. And um, she pushed me into position. She pushed me into accepting the position of social secretary at a young age. I didn't think I could do it, but she knew that I could. And she said there was a safety net for me. And then when she was offered the position of secretary of state by President Obama, she reached back out to me and she said, is there something you'd like to do? And all the time I was social secretary, I kept looking across to that chief of protocol job. I'm like, that's what I want to do. That's where my core yearns to be. I want to be with an international community. I feel so at home with the diplomatic corps, with the foreign diplomatic corps, um, less with you know general Americans. But uh, so it just it just it just read to me. And when she asked me, I said absolutely, chief of protocol. And I loved every moment that I was in that position. Now, my book that LaShawn noted, um, The Power of Protocol and How to Make It Work for You. And there, I really was trying to take all of the um, lessons that I had learned and the tools that I had developed and making them relatable to people in their everyday life and in their business life. Um, so I would love to say you should buy the book. Um, <laughs> and I think you can see how it is actually quite um, applicable. I mean, all of these tools, we should be adhering to a bit more of how we can be conscious about our uh, social behavior in, in all of our interactions and how you can heighten those and how you can make them more effective um, in your work engagements and your personal life. Um, we'll have one online question, then we'll move to our queue, which is here in the room. You told us previously a kind of fascinating story about Russia. And um, 
of the former Soviet Union and a chain link fence and the importance of giving. And I think it kind of demonstrates the importance of thinking hard about the gift and what it conveys. And I wonder if you could share that with our audience today. Oh, absolutely. Um, so when it, when it comes to certain countries, we, we put just a, maybe a little bit more effort into our thought process about what we are going to give. And um, during the time that President Medvedev um, was the president of Russia. Um, we, we, we came up with quite a few, I thought, interesting gifts. And one in particular um, was a piece of a chain link fence from the first Russian settlement out in California. We were very lucky that they, they gave us this cherished um, um, symbol um, and, and, but it was, it had so much meaning behind it. First it was, we're so appreciative of the Russian people and that they are now a part of our American fabric and they are part of the great American quilt here. Um, but also th this chain link fence should say we are on the same side. We are not on opposite sides of any engagement. Let us be friends and join on the same side. And so there was just a lot of nuance there. And I was really lucky in, again, in serving President Obama, because I could explain these things to him, all of the symbolism within these gifts. And he would just like take it and go, now, let me tell you, let me tell you about this gift. Okay. I mean, this is, this might just look like a piece of fence to you, but it's got a lot of meaning. And he, and he would really go into it. And I was like, yes, he got it. And, and you would see sort of the light you know, in the eye of the recipient. That's what you want to do. You want to create that connection. You want to create that moment, that thought, hmm, okay, I get it. And you're moving the needle in that relationship. You're really drawing them in. You're doing exactly what Joseph Nye said. You're drawing them into you. From the mic. And if you could speak uh, loudly into the mic, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? I think so. Yes. I think so. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chris. I work for the Office of the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives. Um, one of the great perks of working here is I get to make great chats like this. Uh, my question, um, I think you've at least been speaking parallel to my question, so maybe it's just a matter of connecting the dots for me. Um, and it responds to an earlier quote from uh, the beginning of this discussion, where you said something to the effect of, uh, if this process is done haphazardly, you may miss opportunities to pivot the power uh, in your leader's favor in an interaction. I'm curious to hear a little bit about your experience uh, were there ever interactions where the design of how you scaffolded it was to pivot the soft power towards the person that you were meeting, not to platform them and to make them feel like they had more, I guess, soft power in a situation where they may feel coming in, but they didn't have as much? So, I'm sorry, uh, where I was trying to raise them up, I was trying yeah. to yeah. give them... So actually a, a super interesting example of that is um, was at the signing of the start to treaty and thank you for your question um, it, we were in the Czech Republic and there was a whole host of things that went on um, during that visit I mean just so much from the um, our interpreter being locked out of the room and me turning to my counterpart in, in who is a lovely young man, but seemed quite new in the position and saying, okay, this is terrific, but how are they going to talk? Can we let that guy into the room? And he's like, oh, oh, and still refused to do it. And then I finally turned to the president. I go, can you ask the leader if you can have your interpreter? And I just loved again, that relationship. And finally he turns and goes, yeah, I can't talk to you. I need the guy out there. And it was just one of these visits where it was, everything was super, super tense. Everything was really riding on the line there and, and just the actual physical signing. So I paid a lot of attention with my counterpart. Um, and that, again, another engagement with President Medvedev on what did this look like? Visually, this was going to be very, very important, this signing. And, um, you know, we, and it was, again, in a third party country. So neither of us had a lot of control. Um, I was very appreciative that the Russians brought beautiful flags. Those were, those were terrific. They have very good flags in their country. And, and then where did they put like flower arrangements? What the desk look like? And then we realized something that President Obama is clearly just about, what, 20 feet taller than Medvedev, right? And so if they're sitting, seated at the same size chair, he's going to look like the teacher and Medvedev is going to look 
like the student. He's going to look very, you know, very much like a child. And so we thought, well, we have to help him out. And so I called in and I explained this to my Russian counterpart. I said, we've got to do something about this chair. This is not going to be good. Now you couldn't bring in a different chair. Everything in, there are certain rules in, in protocol. You have, you're trying to constantly create parity. You want things to be on equal footing in, in particularly in these, in these circumstances. And so what they did in the 11th hour was they raised Medvedev's chair up several inches so that he, when he sat in it, and it took him a a little bit of a scoot to do so, but when he sat in it, he was almost, I mean, he was, he was closer on uh, equal height as President um, Obama. And that was really important. So when you looked at that picture, it was these two global leaders almost on uh, at the, the same height, but the appearance that photo was super, super important. I felt, you know, and, and my counterpart, Marina, she was terrific during Medvedev's time, um, was really great about, it. she was so incredibly appreciative of that moment and shared it with the then uh, president who was very grateful to us and also then to President Obama. Um, we will get to our uh, in-person question, but there was a question online um, before I made the, all the questions disappear. So I need a code from, from Tom about, and, and it, it picks up in kind of what you've just said, but it's a question about like the role of social media and a 24 seven news cycle and mm-hmm. how it influences decisions, both about protocol and about gift giving. The story you shared about the visit with her majesty from 2009 versus 2011 there's an instant headline. Everyone's perhaps tweeting or putting things in social media about it. it how does it change the pressure that you're under? And how does it change your decision making to know that there's a 24-7 media cycle about the gift, perhaps, and that um, it's also instantaneous, the reaction to it? Mm. Well, if I could slightly um, uh, change the circumstances, it wasn't a gift giving moment, but social media really snafu'd me. You know, what we're trying to do in protocol is really stay under the radar. You know, that's pretty much why no one ever hears about it. You know, we consider ourselves the swans gliding on the lake while our feet are, you know, just going like this beneath the water. Um, And when it does go bad, it goes really bad fast and very loud. Uh, when I was at a um, the a UN um, the United Nations General Assembly gathering at the Waldorf Astoria with the president, and we were putting together um, bylet for bylet for bylet. I mean, the president was constantly moving, and we were also managing. We also managed the vice president's movements, his travel, the secretary's movements, her travel, the first lady, the second lady. So we have a lot going on, and they were doing quite a bit in this administration. The president also decided at that gathering to host the ASEAN leaders. You know, we, we just didn't have enough to do. So let's have another summit within a summit. So um, at that, and you, you, know, you, you serve at the pleasure of the president. But in putting that event together, we had to bring in some outside assistance. So we had someone who assisted us in posting the flags. We explained exactly how you do it, how they're supposed to be posted, and flags are incredible incredibly important symbols of a nation, incredibly important. And so um, as I was moving on with the event and announcing the leaders to stage, the flags were posted, I went back and now I'm, my head is already on to the next event, I'm moving forward and I've got staff coming at me with like robot arms of Houston, we've got a problem, oh my gosh, we've got a problem. And I'm standing like, what happened? And they said, uh, the flag of the Philippines. It was inadvertently hung wrong. Not only was it hung upside down, but it was inverted. And when hung like that, um, not only is it an embarrassment, but it indicated that the country was at war. And the firestorm came from social media. It was everywhere in the Philippines. Of course, they're watching this live. There's their leader with the president of the United States. And, and they're like, why are we not at war? What is happening? And it was like, boom, 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 coming in. And so I was like, okay, first and foremost, fix the flag. So we had to fix the flag. Second, make the apologies. 
go directly to the ambassador of the Philippines and make my apologies uh, to the ambassador. He's like, oh, Capricia, it's no problem, but you got to get on social media and you got to put a statement out like immediately because it is a firestorm everywhere. So we drafted a statement where again, on behalf of our country, I apologize, stating that this was completely inadvertent. And so we put that out. But then the last apology and the worst that I had to make was to the president of the United States. So Barack Obama comes off the stage. We're standing in sort of this, you know, blue curtain alcove. And I'm looking up and he's like, you know, 500 feet above me. And I explained to him what happened and then what I did. And this is a fireable offense. I thought for sure. This is it. Last day. I'm out of here. And he looks at me and he goes, okay, Capricia, so uh, this is never going to happen again, right? And I'm like, no, Mr. President, I promise it will never happen again. And thank goodness it never did. <laughs> well, but it is an incredible story of both owning one's mistake, whether it was you or one of your staff members, resilience, and obviously mutual respect. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question from the mic. Hi, it's a pleasure to hear you talk today. Um, I'm not actually directly affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania. I am a private school about an hour away, but I saw this and I knew I had to come see it. Um, I was curious what led to your departure from the administration in 2013 and what you've done over the last decade or so since. The departure is in <laughs> um, You know, it was, it was um, with a very heavy heart that I decided to um, leave the administration at that point. I loved, I've, I've never loved doing something as much as I, I love that position, but I love my son more. And, uh, my husband is a, is a cardiologist. And so he works 24 seven and, um, you know, he was just hitting 13 and there need just be a little bit more supervision in the house. And I needed something that had a little bit more flexibility in the hours. We were traveling at just the speed of light. And I, when I mean, you take, I mean, President Obama couldn't have been kinder and he tried to convince me several times to stay. I mean, one time just, I was sobbing saying, I, would, I do, I want to, but I, I just knew in my heart of hearts that I, that that was the right decision uh, to make at that time in my life um, and for my family. And so he very kindly invited the three of us into the Oval Office um, to, to visit with him and to bid farewell. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a really touching moment. I'm sorry, your second part of your question was? What have you done in the last decade or so? So since leaving um, the, so, so I, I tried, to, I, I, as I stated, I loved the position. I loved what I was doing. And so I, I really went about trying to determine how I could create a flexible lifestyle that would allow me to continue this and really sort of led to my writing the book. I realized that when I left the position that in, you know, companies will proclaim, oh, we're a global company and I'm a global CEO. Well, what do you do to engage properly with those countries that you have factories in or with people that you're trying to sell your product to. And um, the more I had discussions with various, you know, Fortune 50 CEOs, I was realizing they were really missing out and an opportunity um, to make a critical connection, but also at times offending many people that they were working with. And um, so I've been doing, I opened up my own consulting business and I've been consulting um, with them on that on global engagements as well. I am um, ambassador in residence at, as LaShawn noted, at the Atlantic Council and work primarily in their Latin America Center and their Resilience Center. Um, we have a question in the audience. And before we get to your question, which will be immediately after I ask a question from, um, from online, which I think is a very uh, relevant one. Um, your job either has made you extraordinarily, or a combination of kind of extraordinarily aware and kind and sympathetic to all of the shortcomings you must see around you. And one of the things that you all should know is that Capricia was supposed to be sitting here and I put everything in the wrong place. And she very graciously, when she finished her remarks, without missing a beat, just went to the other chair. But mm -hmm. this was the, this was where she was supposed to be sitting. But it's like, how do you respond to the, um, the, if not the lack of protocol, the lack of attention to the details that you know will make everyone's lives better, whether that's, you know, table manners or anything else, because your eye and your whole being has been trained to kind of see this and not, not unsee it. Well, I mean, first of all, to be, to be you know, I, I've, I've tried 
there are instances where maybe I, I, I may, may lack in my, my compassion, um, but I try to be understanding that, um, you know, many people are, 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 you know, not many people, but some people in some instances may be confused or may just not appreciate, or you can find a teachable moment in a gracious, hospitable way, um, making a suggestion. Um, last night at, at our dinner, um, we were having a discussion at our table and um, someone asked me, you know, oh, do, you know, was everything on the table appropriately? And I said, well, yes, absolutely, of course. And I, I may have brought the bread down to the left a little bit more, but, you know, it's, it was all lovely, lovely. And then I explained to them this, um, this wonderful tool that I use where you take and you, you pinch your fingers together um, on the left and then on the right. On the right, it creates a D, and on the left, it creates a B. Many people can get confused when they're seated at a table of what's my bread and what's my drink. Your bread should always be on your left, and your drink should always be on your right, so you know to reach to that glass. I, one time, was at a very big engagement in Washington, D.C. with lots of hoi polloi, and this man seated to my right, re to my left, rather, reached over on his right and took my bread. And I'm like, hmm, now everyone else took their bread on their left. So he had his extra bread. And I thought, well, maybe this man really needs extra bread. But I didn't know. He just took the wrong bread. So I kindly looked at him and I'm like, you know, I, may I now have your bread that is on your left? He goes, no, this is, I mean, he's now debating me. He said, no, this is my bread. This is, this is where you get the bread. You get the bread on the right. Everybody should have taken the bread. And he's trying to. And my dear friend who's seated across the table for me, she goes, I think your chief of protocol might know which side the bread is on. And I said, no, 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 it's quite all right. Many people make this very simple error at the dinner party. And I, and I proceeded to show him and he's like, okay, thank you. And so then he handed me the bread that he already touched. And I was like, <laughs> I would prefer to have that bread over there. But, you know, if you can, by just taking a moment of understanding and perhaps uh, make it a teachable moment. Great, and from the mic. Hi, my name is Fiona and I'm a first year um, here at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I was just wondering what you mentioned about, um, you know, seeing that now in the business world as well and you starting your own protocol consultancy firm. Is that something that we're going to be seeing a lot more? I mean, I had never heard of protocol positions um, before this talk, is that something that we're going to see as a staple in global business negotiations in the future, you think? I certainly hope so. Um, <laughs> um, because, I mean, I, I do think that, frankly, there is a lack of that understanding and appreciation of these um, social codes of conduct and rules of international engagement that can help streamline some of these um, discussions and negotiations. I, I work very closely with Mike Bloomberg and the Bloomberg team, and he hosts a lot of international engagements. And I was in Singapore with him recently. I'm about to go to Panama for an engagement with them. Um, uh, we were in, in China and Beijing, and in particular there. Because in Beijing, you're not just dealing with a CEO because we know that the CEOs are really linked to the government as well. So there's a lot of connectivity there. And he has now, I mean, at first he was like, come on, Capricia. Like, <laughs> I'd be like, no, Mike, this is important. And I said, let me tell you why you have to do it like this. And so now he literally will turn. He's like, okay, Capricia, tell me what I got to do. And I grew to... I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he grew to appreciate me because I've grown to appreciate him, his willingness to appreciate his willingness um, to adhere to this, to learn to how it can better uh, his interactions and his engagements. And, um, you know, I've, I've now worked with um, quite a few other uh, CEOs preparing them for travels abroad. I had a, a great briefing with the CEO of 3M on you know, sort of expectations when he goes to certain countries um, and, and things like that. Um, so as we wrap up, I want you to just kind of stay seated for a couple of both closing remarks. And um, I wanted to say that I always enjoy when you come here and now that Cole's graduating, I hope we still get to see you. Um, and I feel like one of the many um, important pieces of value of this conversation has really been that for those of you in the audience here and those of you online that um, how one behaves matters. 
the thoughtfulness that one um, gives to gift giving matters. And then in a world of very complex diplomatic global relations, small things matter, large things matter, medium sized things matter, and that you can't put too much thought in it. Like putting actual thought into these things really matter and goes toward achieving your global policy and other goals. So I am thankful to you as always for reminding us of that and reminding us of the hard work and deep thought that goes into the global diplomacy and that this is in fact central to it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I also just wanted to say to our audience both here and um, online that we hope to see you again next Tuesday, April the 12th for a discussion about the Oscar nominated animated documentary film Flea with Graham Reed, director of the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Rights Program at Human Rights Watch, and Fernando Chang Moy, the Thomas H. Boyle Lecturer in Law at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. And on Thursday, April the 14th, we will be hosting Sergei Kuzlita, who serves as the ambassador uh, of the Ukraine to the United Nations for a keynote address for our workshop on the global order after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These events will be in person at Perry World House and live streamed on Zoom. As always, you can um, access uh, a recording of this conversation on the Perry World House YouTube channel and can find out all about the great events we've planned for the rest of the semester by joining the mailing list and following us on all social media humanly possible and I will not list them. So once again, thank you so much for joining us and please grab a snack on your way out. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.